Heracles, better known as Hercules. Monsters, animals, and the beautiful sirens. Welcome, dear viewers, to an enchanting journey through the legendary world of Greek mythology, where gods play with the fates of men and heroes rise against formidable creatures. Join us on a single epic journey that intertwines the legendary tales of Greek monsters and the daring heroes who challenged them. The Curse of the Minotaur. Our saga begins in the Grand Palace of King Minos of Crete, where the sea god Poseidon's wrath manifests in the form of the Minotaur, a monstrous creature with the head of a bull and the body of a man. Locked within the confounding labyrinth designed by the master craftsman Daedalus, the Minotaur's roar echoes through the corridors, a chilling reminder of the king's hubris. Enter Theseus, the brave prince of Athens, determined to end the terror. Guided by Ariadne's golden thread and driven by the promise of peace, Theseus navigates the maze's dark twists and confronts the beast with nothing but his bare hands and a sharp sword. The battle is fierce, but Theseus emerges victorious, liberating Crete from its curse. Hercules and the Nemean Lion As Theseus sails back to Athens, we shift our gaze to the rugged lands of Nemea, where Hercules faces his first labor. The Nemean lion with its golden fur impervious to mortal weapons ravages the countryside. Hercules, renowned for his strength and courage, engages in a brutal battle with the beast. The air is thick with dust and roars as Hercules grapples with the lion, finally defeating it through a combination of sheer force and cunning, using the lion's own claw to skin it. Wearing the lion's hide as armor, Hercules sets off to his next labor, his legend growing with each step. Heracles, better known as Hercules, son of Zeus, the most famous hero ever, who is also the world's most famous. Busted. Bastard. 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 Hey, I'm not saying that as an insult, I'm just calling it like it is to teach Heracles a lesson. Never forget what you are. The rest of the world will not. Wear it like armor. And it can never be used to hurt you. Hercules was born out of wedlock, with his father Zeus raw dogging someone other than his wife Hera, which is why it is important to not call him Hercules, but Heracles. Well, to be precise, it's Heracles and Hera is Hera, but you know, let's keep it simple with the pronunciations, and call him Hera and Heracles. And Heracles translates to Hera's glory and the name was given to him by Zeus to make Hera happy but imagine your loved one cheats on you and then names the illegitimate child after you I feel like that's just the <laughs> that's ultimate disrespect and to make things more complicated his mortal birth name is actually Alcaeus before Zeus guilty conscience gave him the name Heracles that the Romans then changed to Hercules anyway you know him as a big, muscular hero, slayer of beasts, right? Well, what if I told you that Heracles actually killed his own wife and children, murdered more than any serial killer you're obsessing over on Netflix, cheated and slept around in ways that would even impress his dad Zeus, and often Heracles was as far from a hero as anybody could be. But also, he was a hero, in a way he was a hero, not just for once impregnating 50 women and 50 consecutive nights, but for actually doing heroic things. So let's meet the real Hercules, let's meet Heracles, like you've never seen him. Heracles' story starts when Zeus slept with his great-granddaughter. <laughs> <What the fuck? laughs> yeah, surprise, new lows. This time, Zeus slept with the great-granddaughter of his own son, Perseus. And Perseus, by the way, was also a... He's a bastard! To be precise, Zeus slept with Perseus' great-granddaughter, Almini, and got her pregnant, because he was, you know... Raw. He didn't just get pregnant though, I mean he was actually married to a king in fact, but Zeus really wanted to tap his great granddaughter so when her husband the king went away to war, Zeus transformed, shapeshifted into her husband and paid his great granddaughter a visit for some godly loving in disguise. Great grandfather style. When the king returned and found his wife was pregnant, he was kind of confused, understandably. He was like, Let's burn her! Yeah, burn her, burn her! But just in time, Zeus intervened and told the king what he did, and that also his wife was actually pregnant with two sons, and one of them is the king's. Yay! Two for one. <laughs> to celebrate the occasion, Zeus told the happy 
couple that a prophecy was foretold that the next son born from Perseus' bloodline would become the king of Mykne. Yay! So, no hard feelings, right? So, Hera, who was listening from all this up on Mount Olympus, was like, Oh, next king of Mykene, huh? Oh, really? And Hera went to her daughter, Edithea, the goddess of childbirth, and told her, Listen, baby girl, the next bastard that is born into Zeus's other bastard, Perseus's bloodline, will take over his little bastard kingdom, and I don't want it to be his new bastard. Well, forced by Hera, Edithea delayed the birth of Heracles and his twin brother long enough for Achmenes' cousin, who happened to also be pregnant, to give birth first. And so a boy named Evristeus was born, born into Perseus' bloodline before Heracles or his brother, and so Heracles' cousin Evristeus became king of Mykene. Hera, though, was not satisfied with just having foiled Heracles' prophesied kinghood. She wanted to inflict more damage, so she felt like murdering an infant is the next logical step here. Don't be shocked, Hera was new to this. She once threw her own baby down a cliff because it was too ugly. <laughs> For this premeditated baby murder, Hera sent two snakes into baby Heracles' crib to poison him. But little baby Heracles was like, What do we say to the god of death? Not the name! <laughs> And he strangled the snakes, he was too strong, and also was kind of showing early signs of animal abuse that will play a major role later in his life. His mother, Almini, was terrified that somebody would attempt to kill her baby, and she vowed that she would do anything to protect her baby boy, that she would do anything to protect Heracles. Yeah. She took baby Heracles into the forest and abandoned him there. Jason and the Golden Fleece. Our tale sweeps across the seas to join Jason and his band of Argonauts aboard the Argo, questing for the Golden Fleece. As they approach Colchis, the landscape is fraught with dangers, from the hypnotic sirens to the clashing simple gates. But the greatest challenge awaits in the sacred grove of Ares, where the fleece is guarded by a never-sleeping dragon. Using cunning and the help of the sorceress Medea, Jason retrieves the fleece in a daring nocturnal heist, evading the dragon's fiery breath and escaping into the night, the fleece in hand, symbolizing his right to claim the throne of Iolcus, the defeat of Medusa. Our hero's paths converge as Perseus, tasked with slaying Medusa, joins forces with Hercules and Theseus. Together, they journey to the remote island where Medusa lurks. Hunted by many warriors who wished to claim the prize of her head. Many tried, and many failed, turned to stone with just a glance at her hideous face. Medusa was not always considered a monster. In fact, it was quite the opposite. She was the only mortal of three sisters born to Phorkys and Ceto, two of the primordial sea gods. She possessed great beauty, and many men lusted for Medusa. But out of respect for the goddess Athena, she remained pure, and she would eventually become the priestess of Athena's temple. There were thousands who visited Athena's temple just for a glance at Medusa's beauty. They even claimed that her hair rivaled that of Athena. It wasn't long before Athena's jealousy of Medusa became resent. One day when Medusa was walking along the shore, she caught the attention of Poseidon, the god of the sea, and he was instantly infatuated with her. Medusa rejected multiple approaches from Poseidon, because if she wished to remain the priestess of Athena's temple, she must stay a virgin. Poseidon was in the middle of a conflict with Athena, and he saw Medusa as a possession that he could take from the goddess. Eventually Poseidon grew tired of being rejected by Medusa. He decided that he would take her by force. Medusa, in fear for her life, ran into Athena's temple in the hopes that the goddess would offer her protection. There was no protection given that evening, and Poseidon had his way with Medusa. When Poseidon had finished, Athena did appear, enraged by the events that had just taken place. She decided that she would punish Medusa, as punishment against a god such as Poseidon was considered unthinkable. Athena cursed Medusa. The hair that she was once so envious of, she turned into a head of venomous snakes. Anyone who looked into Medusa's eyes would be petrified and turned to stone. Word spread of the monster that Medusa had become, and she became the target of many warriors who wished to add her head to their list of trophies. All that tried shared the same fate, being turned into stone. Until the hero Perseus, 
son of Zeus, was tasked with retrieving her head. In order to complete the task, Perseus required aid from the gods. He was given a helmet from Hades that made him invisible to Medusa, a pair of winged sandals from Hermes allowing him to reach Medusa. Athena gave him a bronze shield able to reflect the gaze of Medusa, and lastly he was given a sword sharp enough to cut off the head of Medusa. With all of these divine gifts, Perseus was able to behead Medusa. At the time of her death, Medusa was pregnant with the offspring of Poseidon, and from her severed neck sprung the winged steed Pegasus. Perseus would use the head of Medusa to aid him in several adventures, and it played a crucial role when defeating the titan Atlas. Medusa is probably one of the most misunderstood characters in Greek mythology. She is often regarded as a cruel monster. She had only the best intentions and placed her trust in the goddess Athena, who ultimately failed her and punished her for actions that were beyond her control. Her story shows us that even the gods are prone to the sins that they so heavily pride themselves above. Even in death Medusa can be seen as a symbol of good, as her head is used as a protective amulet to keep evil away. The heroes navigate the petrified figures of previous challengers, a garden of stone testaments to Medusa's power. With Athena's mirrored shield, Perseus reflects Medusa's gaze, confronting her without meeting her eyes, and beheads her in a swift, decisive stroke. The land is freed from her terror, and from Medusa's severed neck springs Pegasus, the winged horse, signifying hope and new adventures. Conclusion as our heroes ride back to Athens, their paths laden with glory and tales for the ages, we reflect on their journeys, interwoven threads of bravery, cunning, and the quest for righteousness in a world ruled by capricious gods and daunting monsters. These stories, carved into the bedrock of culture, continue to inspire courage and adventure in the hearts of all who hear them. Wowzers! Pretty fascinating story, don't you think? Well, please, smash the like button! The wild tales of Greek mythology suggest the ancient Greeks were surrounded by monsters, animals, and strange hybrid creatures that joined humans and animals together. Some were friendly and wise, some were vicious and famous for fighting heroes on their quests, while others simply put fear into both the gods and mortals because of their ferocious and deadly behaviors. Here are some of the better known of these, Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla and Charybdis are two of the best known monsters in Greek mythology and two of the scariest. Both were extremely dangerous for sailors on the high seas and they ruled a stretch of narrow waters believed to be the Straits of Messina that many ships had to navigate through. Scylla was a six-headed monster which, when ships passed, tried to swallow one sailor for each of its heads. Charybdis created an enormous whirlpool that threatened to swallow the entire ship. These two monsters are well known from the story of the hero Odysseus in Homer's book Odyssey Book 13. Scylla was a supernatural female creature, with twelve feet and six heads on long, snaky necks, each head having a triple row of shark-like teeth, while her upper legs were surrounded by the heads of vicious dogs. From her home in a cave, she ate whatever came within reach, including six of Odysseus's companions. The name Scylla means puppy, and it is believed this monster could only make puppy noises. She would wait for fish, dolphins, and men to pass her way, and then rush out one of her heads to drag the victim back into her cave to be eaten. Charybdis, who lived under a fig tree on a nearby shore to the narrow waters, swallowed and spat out the waters three times a day to create a deadly whirlpool that would trap ships. When Greek hero Odysseus became shipwrecked, he barely escaped her clutches by clinging to a tree until the improvised raft that she swallowed floated back to the surface after many hours. Pegasus the winged horse. Pegasus was an immortal winged horse, one of the two children of Poseidon and Medusa. The flying horse is said to have been born from his pregnant mother's neck after she was killed. He was then raised by the Muses at Mount Helicon, where he was taken by the goddess Athena. In all of his excitement for being given to those women, Pegasus began striking the side of the mountain with his hooves and his marks caused springs of water to turn into flowing fountains of inspiration. Those springs became sacred to the muses who loved and respected their flying horse. Pegasus eventually ended up on Mount Olympus and worked for Zeus pulling his chariot. After years of service, Zeus awarded Pegasus with a constellation, which carries his name to this day. Pegasus lived on Mount Olympus until his death. Ever since then, he has been known as an inspiration for artists of all kinds. Centaur, the horseman. 
Centaurs are half-human, half-horse creatures. They have the body of a horse, but the torso, head, and arms of a man. They were considered to be the children of Ixion, king of the Lapiths, and Nephile, a cloud made in the image of the goddess Hera. According to a different myth, however, they were all born from the relationship between a single centaurus with the Magnesian mares. One of the best known and wisest centaurs was Chiron. Although most centaurs were described as wild, Chiron was different. He was modest and civilized, and famous for his medicinal skills and teaching abilities. He lived on Mount Pelion in Thessaly and taught several Greek mythical characters such as Achilles. He was immortal, but he was accidentally wounded by Heracles with an arrow treated with the blood of the monster Hydra, causing him terrible pain. So when Heracles asked his father to free Prometheus, and Zeus demanded that someone must be sacrificed, Chiron volunteered and died both to free Prometheus and himself from the pain. Cyclopes the One-Eyed Giants Cyclopes were huge creatures with enormous strength and one eye in the middle of their foreheads. Originally, there were three of them, Arges, Steropes, and Brontes. They were all very good blacksmiths. One day they were taken prisoner by Cronus, but later released by Cronus's son, Zeus. They were so grateful for their freedom, they created Zeus's famous thunderbolt as a symbol of thanks. Greek mythology also mentions a different kind of Cyclopes. This race was not so smart, and the violent one-eyed creatures lived in caves with sheep they had gathered on the island of Sicily. The word Cyclops can be translated as round-eyed, but many authors of Greek mythology feel that it is derived from a much older word which originally meant sheep thief. Both describe the Cyclopes well. Odysseus and his men spent several days without seeing solid ground in their heroic attempt to return home, when they finally found an island on the horizon. It was the famous island of the Cyclops, one-eyed creatures, sons of Poseidon, the mighty god of the seas. Odysseus wanted to meet the island's inhabitants, and chose twelve of his best men to explore the island with him. They found a large cave, and the sound of screeching sheep could be heard from inside. Upon entering the cave, Odysseus realized that this was the home of one of the beings that inhabited the island. Inside the cave, there was an enclosure with some sheep, amphorae filled with goat's milk, and bowls with fresh cheese made from it. Odysseus tasted some of the cheese and thought about stealing it, but decided to wait for the return of the cave dweller and negotiate with him. But the hero would regret this decision. The huge cyclops appeared in front of the cave, bringing with him part of his herd that he had taken out to graze. Odysseus and his men hid, fearing for their lives. But the hiding places of the sailors were revealed when the cyclops lit a fire in the center of the cave. Odysseus came out of his hiding place and introduced himself to the monster, saying who he was and what he was doing there by asking for hospitality. The Cyclops said that his name was Polyphemus, the most glorious of his race. He claimed that he owned no hospitality to inferior beings, for he did not recognize the laws of men. Polyphemus grabbed two of Odysseus's men by the legs and slammed them to the ground, killing them immediately. As if this weren't enough, the beast still devoured them completely. The mighty Cyclops moved a huge stone and blocked the exit of the cave. After that nasty meal, the Cyclops decided to sleep. Odysseus's men wanted to kill him while he slept, but the cunning leader stopped them because it would be impossible to move the heavy stone blocking the cave exit. The next day, the giant took his sheep out to pasture, leaving the men locked in the cave. Odysseus, together with his men, planned a way to avenge the death of his colleagues. They found a large log of wood and sharpened one end. At the end of the day, the Cyclops returned and, after re-entering, closed the exit of the cave. Odysseus poured into a jar the wine from the wineskins of all his men to offer it to the one-eyed giant. Polyphemus drank with satisfaction the strong wine offered by Odysseus and liked the gesture. He told the hero that, as a reward, he would be the last to be devoured and asked Odysseus his name. He replied that his name was Nobody and that everyone knew him that way. 
drunken Polyphemus felt an irresistible urge to sleep. Odysseus and his men took the makeshift weapon and prepared their revenge. They ran with the sharp stake toward the monster's one eye. The Cyclops woke up and screamed in pain. After hearing his brother's terrible screams, two other Cyclops appeared at the entrance to the cave. They asked who had done it, and Polyphemus shouted, Nobody, nobody has pierced my eye. Since there was no one to punish, they returned to their homes. The next day, the blind Cyclops let the animals out to graze, but he did not expect Odysseus to use another trick. Clinging to the bellies of the strong rams, Odysseus and his men managed to escape Polyphemus' cave. When they were all out of the cave, they quickly ran to the ships. On the ship, Odysseus shouted at the monster, saying that being blinded was a deserved punishment for a criminal who disregarded Zeus's designs by devouring those who had asked for hospitality. Polyphemus pulled a large chunk out of a mountain and threw it in the direction of Odysseus's cries. The great rock fell near the ship of the king of Ithaca. His men begged him to stop taunting the beast, but Odysseus continued. He shouted again, saying that when someone asked him who had pierced his eye, he should answer that it was the man who devastated the city of Troy, son of Laertes, the great Odysseus, the king of Ithaca. The furious Polyphemus threw another boulder at Odysseus's ship, and it grazed the ship of the Greeks. Odysseus walked away from the island of the Cyclops, regretting that he had lost some men, but excited that he had overcome a huge challenge. Polyphemus asked his divine father and begged Poseidon to punish the man responsible for piercing his son's eye. He asked that the god of the seas prevent Odysseus from returning home. If the gods so willed, he should wander the seas for years, arriving home without ship, treasure, and companions. Odysseus's haughtiness, which led him to mock the son of Poseidon, would cost him dearly, for he now had the god of the seas as an enemy. The Gorgons. The Gorgons were three famous and scary monsters with ugly faces and snakes for hair. They were the daughters of Echidna and Typhon, who were considered the mother and father of all monsters. The daughters' names were Stheno, Uriele, and the most famous of them all, Medusa. Medusa was once a beautiful young woman, the only human of the three sisters. Her beauty caught the eye of the sea god Poseidon, who tried to seduce her in the sacred temple of Athena. Furious that this event took place in her temple, Athena transformed Medusa into a monster with the deadly capacity to turn whoever looked upon her face to stone. Medusa was eventually killed by the Greek hero Perseus, after King Seraphis ordered him to bring him Medusa's head. The Sirens The Sirens were mythical creatures that sang so beautifully. They were able to attract the attention of any sailors passing by and lure them to their deaths. Each siren combined the appearance of a woman and a bird, but the exact appearance would change depending on the artist drawing the images. Some drew sirens that had bodies of birds with the heads of women, while others made them look like women with the legs of birds. In later years, sirens were drawn more like mermaids with long tails. Whatever their form, the daughters of the river god Achilles and a muse, they were destined to die if anyone should survive their singing. The most famous story about the sirens comes in Homer's The Odyssey, as Greek hero Odysseus and his men sailed by them. Odysseus had been warned about the dangers of the sirens, and he prepared his men by having them put beeswax in their ears to block out the song. They then tied Odysseus to the mast of the boat, as he wanted to hear what the sirens sang about. The beautiful song caused Odysseus to order that his men untie him, but instead they tightened the ropes and waited until they were clear of the sirens to release him. Once Odysseus and his sailors had passed the sirens unharmed, the creatures threw themselves into the sea and were drowned. If this tapestry of myth and might has captured your imagination, please like, share, and subscribe for more tales of valor and mystique. Join us as we continue to explore the timeless legends that shape our world and kindle the heroic spirit within us all. Thank you for watching Mythic Time Machine. For great gifts and gadgets, visit megdigital.com. Enter the code treasure for 15% off. Arg. Arg. Arg.
Arr.